Welcome to another what I washed in the last month and this is for the month of July I can't believe the summer is almost over I feel like it just started and now it's gonna be back to school This month is different because I ended up watching for some reason a lot of romantic comedies and less horrors and thrillers which is usually my go-to style of movies and I was specifically looking for a lot of movies that had the summer vibes so this list is gonna be full of movies that give you summer vibes maybe you'll appreciate that so that you can soak up the last two weeks or so left of summer and you know we can start preparing for spooky season also this month I did not watch a lot of new movies kind of slacked off on that this month and ended up watching a lot of older movies so I don't have as many new stuff to mention. I have a few, but not as many as usual. And there are so many good movies that are in theaters right now that I have not watched yet. In fact, one of the main ones that I really want to watch is Nope from Jordan Peele. If you don't know, he directed Get Out and Us, and they are both fantastic movies, and I need to watch Nope. We're planning to watch it literally in the next two days, but I had to film this video before it gets too late in the next month. So... I guess I'll have to wait till the end of August to give my review on Nope, but I'm very excited for that movie. I also really want to watch Elvis. I want to see Black Phone and uh, Top Gun Maverick. I'm still curious about that one. I'm obviously going to have to wait till I rent that one. And Lightyear is coming out August 3rd on Disney+, Plus, so I'll be watching that for the first time as well. So I have a lot of movies I'm looking forward to watching soon in this month, but unfortunately, I'm a little late to the game with those. Comment down below and let me know if you've watched any of those movies. Any new movies that are in theaters right now, let me know what you thought because uh, this looks like the month we'll be going to the theaters again. <laughs> I am excited to talk about a new movie that came out this month. It is currently on Apple TV and it is a 2022 drama called Cha Cha Real Smooth. This is actually probably one of my favorite movies I've seen in a while. It is a coming of age style movie. I feel like coming of age films is one of my favorite styles of movies. Some examples of that are like Lady Bird, 8th Grade, 13, even The Breakfast Club. Anytime there's a movie where there's a young character who is trying to find themselves or figure out their path or trying to discover who they are, I love movies like that. And this is what Cha Cha Real Smooth is like. It stars Dakota Johnson and Cooper Rafe. Rife. He's actually also the director, which is really cool. I think he also wrote the screenplay. I believe this is like his entire idea, his project, and he stars in it. He is a character who is fresh out of college, and he becomes a bar mitzvah party host. And in that process, he ends up meeting Dakota Johnson's character and falls in love with her complicated self and her life. It's definitely focused on the romance, and I really liked them as a pair. I really liked Dakota Johnson's character, I really liked his character, I thought they really meshed well together and they, to me, they were very interesting. The dialogue and everything about the movie just felt kind of natural and, and realistic, I guess, and I like romantic movies that have a realistic tone to them and are not so cheesy. Personally, I love Silver Lining's playbook and I feel like this movie kind of like reminded me of that movie a little bit. It's not the same at, at all, but I don't know, for some reason they kind of remind me of each other and I, I like those kind of movies and I'm curious if you've seen Cha Cha Real Smooth I think it's worth a watch especially if you like romance and if you like coming of age films then you really should check it out this feels like this happened so long ago but Stranger Things came out at the beginning of this month and now it feels like that was like a whole year ago but <laughs> season 4 of Stranger Things came out on Netflix and I have to say that was the best season of Stranger Things, to my opinion. I'm curious to know what you think, but a lot of people agree with me. I, they think that was the best season. The first season, of course, is also the best season because it's the first season and I don't think anything can compare to that. But for being the fourth season, I felt like they took such a different direction and they did so much with it and they introduced so many. For them to be able to have you keep up with so many characters and for you to like so many of those characters, you end up falling so in love with the different relationships and the different connections and the friendships that go on in the group. And there's so much going on in that season. And I'm so excited for season five. I don't know when that's happening. I think, I feel like it's gonna be a while from now. So we're just gonna have to be patient, but I really, really enjoyed it and binged it like in two days. And I'm sad it's over. Another season that just came out this month is Better Call Saul. That is actually happening right now. I think they're on to like the third episode or the fourth one right now for the new season. This is technically part two of season six. What's weird is that Better Call Saul is on Netflix. 
but the newest season is on AMC Plus. So we had to get AMC Plus just so we could see the newest season of Better Call Saul because we were not about to wait for that to come out eventually on Netflix or I don't know if they're gonna take it off of Netflix, I don't know how that works. This is the end of an era for Better Call Saul and I'm kind of sad about it because I really enjoyed the show. I've talked about Better Call Saul in other videos and I've mentioned that at first I really didn't get into it and then it took a while but then I started to really fall in love with the show and now that it's about to be over, I'm, I'm sad. I am very curious to see how they decide to end the whole thing and we actually just started watching Breaking Bad <laughs> from the beginning all over again. This, is, this will be my third round of watching Breaking Bad if we commit to it. So let's see if we actually end up really watching it again, but Breaking Bad is my favorite show of all time. I have no problem watching that show periodically throughout my life. The next show I wanted to mention is nothing new, pretty random actually, it's Married at First Sight, but specifically season 11, which I think it just came out on Netflix or maybe it was always there and we just noticed it. We've never watched Married at First Sight before. It is a reality dating TV show that is from 2020 and well season 11 is from 2020 it's been going on for a lot longer than that and it's actually a lifetime show if you try to look for like certain seasons they're scattered amongst different platforms some seasons are on netflix some are on hulu some are on pluto tv it's very strange uh but for some reason we decided to watch season 11 specifically and we had such a good time with this show. It was really actually a fun watch. Season 11 has five couples and our personal favorite couple, which I'm sure most people who have watched Married at First Sight can probably agree, is Bennett and Amelia. They are the best couple of them all. And the whole concept of just marrying someone that you've never met before. I'm not someone who's huge on reality TV and I'm also not huge on dating shows, except for a few exceptions. Love is Blind, The Ultimatum, and now Married at First Sight. Oh, and Love on the Spectrum. That is the number one best dating reality TV show ever. I felt like Married at First Sight was a little less drama involved than, for example, Love is Blind and The Ultimatum. Actually, The Ultimatum is the best if you're looking for drama. Let me know if you are a fan, what season should we check out? What's your favorite season? So maybe we can skip right to that one. And speaking of reality TV shows and Love is Blind, we started watching this really silly reality TV show called All Star Shore. It just came out this month and it's currently on Paramount Plus. It is a like reality show, but also kind of like a game show. It's all these different stars from different reality shows who all are on this beach house in the Canary Islands. And the only reason I started watching it is because Giannina from Love is Blind is on it. And I just love her so I wanted to watch her in it. It is so chaotic and it's kind of dumb but it's entertaining. I'm not gonna lie. I'm starting to realize that I might be more of a fan of reality TV than I realize and maybe I'm missing out on a whole genre this whole time because I was always assuming I just didn't like reality TV and, and now I'm slowly falling into it. Obviously it's a little bit based on Jersey Shore and stuff like that and I, I'm, I'm the, I was never a fan of the Jersey Shore or anything like that but I, I find this silly show to be fun, so let me know if you're watching All Star Shore. I feel like no one's probably watching that one, but I'm curious. Next, we have a new show that came out this month as well called The Bear. And this is a drama cooking show that is currently on Hulu. It stars Jeremy Allen White, who is a fine dining chef who ends up moving to Chicago to work for his brother's sandwich shop when he passes away. He kind of takes over the restaurant and is like the head chef. Everything that happens in the kitchen with all the different chefs and all the drama between them, it's just like a lot of anxiety, it's really intense, it's chaotic, and it's very entertaining. There is a lot more to it than just the cooking. Um, a lot of family drama and stuff like that. I think overall it was definitely worth the watch. So one thing I started doing this month is watching Boy Meets World, which feels random, but it's not that random. So there's a podcast that just came out called Pod Meets World, and it is the podcast featuring the characters who play Topanga, Eric, and Sean host the podcast, and they basically are going through every episode one by one and kind of like dissecting and revealing behind the scenes thoughts and stuff like that about everything about the show and I am so into this I am watching every episode along with them listening to the podcast and then watching the episode and kind of 
just going through the whole experience with them and if you are a fan of Boy Meets World because I definitely was when I was a kid I feel like it just gives you such a big appreciation for the show like it makes you realize things about the show that you really weren't looking at because when I was a kid I wasn't really getting all the messages that the show was trying to give you or like what they were trying to do or maybe all the comedy of it and now watching it as an adult I can really appreciate what a good show it truly was and I'm, I'm kind of excited to to take this journey and watch it the whole way through. The first season was filmed in 1993 and it's all on Disney Plus so highly recommend if you were ever a fan checking out the podcast. Another throwback show that I started watching is The OC. I guess it's not really a throwback for me because I never watched it. <laughs> this is my first time seeing The OC. Um, I purposely started watching it because summer vibes. A few months ago I was watching Laguna Beach, which by the way Laguna Beach also has a podcast and this is kind of how I got into this because there's a podcast called Back at the Beach with Kristen and Steven from Laguna Beach where they kind of dive into each episode and do the same thing. I guess this is like a thing going on right now where people who used to be in shows back in the day are now starting podcasts where they kind of talk behind the scenes about the whole experience and uh, I've been w listening to that as well. But I decided to start watching The O.C. because I never did and I, I was always curious. The O.C. started in 2003, it's on Hulu right now and I'm currently only on season 1. I'm about to get to season 2. But it is a soap opera or a drama about a bunch of teenagers in the Orange County. It's definitely romance centered but it's also very much family drama. I figured I would enjoy it because I like Nisha Barden but Honestly, Adam Brody is really sticking out to me and is kind of like one of my favorite parts of watching the show and I intend to keep watching it and I will let you know I guess once I finish the whole show and what I thought. Now we're going to start my list of summer movies. These are movies that either take place in the summer, involve a beach or a pool, <laughs> or just give summer vibes. Starting with Baywatch and I'm talking about the 2017 one that is currently on Paramount Plus and stars Dwayne Johnson and Zac Efron. Obviously this movie gives off summer, but it is a horrible movie. <laughs> it, okay, it's not horrible, it's not good. It has a 17% on Rotten Tomatoes. I still thought it was entertaining, but it's just like not a great movie. And I think I knew that going into it, but if you're looking for a movie all about the beach, the next one on my list is Charlie's Angels. This is the film from 2000 and I had to buy it on Amazon Prime for $3 because I couldn't find it anywhere for free. It stars Drew Barrymore, Cameron Diaz, and Lucy Liu. It even has Bill Murray in it. I do remember watching Charlie's Angels but I didn't remember anything about the movie and watching it now made me realize why I didn't remember anything because nothing really happens in this movie. I don't, it, stuff happens, but like in the whole movie just feels like a whole jumbled up mess of random missions they have to go on and there's this like, I don't know, it felt so jumbled up and silly. I know it's kind of one of those movies that was like meant to not be taken seriously or it's bad in a good way type of thing. It's entertaining in other aspects, you know? I think for me personally, the most enjoyable part of watching the movie is just because their outfits and costumes are fun <laughs> to watch them in. The Tom Green scene though, definitely one of my favorite parts of the whole movie. It's a classic, it's a throwback, I don't know, why not? But this next movie is definitely summer vibes, it's called Hot Summer Nights and it is a 2017 film on Hulu right now for free that is a drama crime featuring Timothy Chalamet and it is about a bunch of teenagers in the summer dealing with drugs and it involves romance. And as much as all of that sounds great to me, I wasn't crazy about it in the end. The movie is like half romance, half drug drama, and um, I guess I didn't care about the drug part. <laughs> I just want the romance. So I don't know, I, I, it was fine. And then speaking of Timothy Chalamet, I ended up watching another movie involving Timothy Chalamet that came out in 2017 that is based on a summer romance. Call Me By Your Name. This is a movie that's based on a novel. I also had to pay $3 on Amazon Prime to watch it because it's not free anywhere. It's about a 17 year old boy who is in Italy for the summer. There's a 27 year old guy who is working for his father and they kind of get involved with each other. And honestly, the movie started slow and kind of boring. If I hadn't paid $3, I might have turned off the movie, but because of the fact that I paid for it, I was like, nah, I'm sticking to it. And honestly, it got really good, and I'm glad I did stick to it, because by the end of it, I I was, 
had a little tear. I really did get into the romance and the relationship and the story and I felt like it was real. I, re I think it was a beautiful movie and it was well done and it gets emotional in the end. I feel like I'm surprised it took this long to finally watch this movie but I get the hype about it. Next we have Little Miss Sunshine and this is definitely a rewatch. I used to love this movie. It's a 2006 family comedy drama that is currently on HBO Max. It stars Steve Carell, Paul Dano, Dano? Dano? Tony Collette, Abigail, who plays Olive. It is just a complicated family and they all have their own individual problems. And they all come together to try to make it on time to this pageant that the little sister Olive wants to go to so bad. And I think it is just such a cute film. There are comedic moments, for sure. But there's more of a serious tone throughout the movie. It's not... I remember it being funnier for some reason. I mean, outside of the dance number towards the end, that's so obviously funny. The rest of it is, is kind of tense, you know? Okay, now finally a horror thriller. Less horror, more thriller. 12 Feet Deep. This is a 2017 film that I did pay $2 on Amazon Prime for because, again, could not find it anywhere for free. And it is about two sisters who get trapped in a public pool. <laughs> which is a very simple plot and literally it is exact that's just what it is it's two girls and the, the entire time the whole film they're stuck in a pool I thought it was pretty decent considering that the whole time they're just in a pool and like you start to wonder how much they can do with that <laughs> and uh, I think they did pretty good with it it's it's definitely like okay and I don't think it was amazing it does remind me of this film called Frozen <laughs> not the Disney one the horror movie that came out in 2010 where the kids get stuck on a ski lift. It's kind of like if you take that movie and then you put them in a pool instead. It's that same kind of style where the whole movie takes place with them in this one situation. I still think it was worth watching because it is a horror movie about pools. Next up we have Girl Next Door and this is a throwback for me because I remember seeing this back in 2004. It is currently on Netflix. It is a romance comedy about an 18 year old boy who falls in love with the girl next door who happens to be a porn star. Seeing it now through the lens of an adult is definitely different than when I remember watching it when I was like 14 years old. It's a really cute movie. I felt like I remembered the porn star aspect of the movie being so much more of a bigger part of it and it really is not it's not the focus, you know? Although it's centered around that, it's not the focus of the movie and really the relationship between the main two characters is really very sweet and I, I thought it was actually surprisingly better than I remembered. So, like I remembered it being raunchier for some reason. It's not that raunchy at all. Next up we have Adventureland and this is a romance comedy from 2009 that is currently on HBO Max starring Kristen Stewart and Jesse Eisenberg. Jeremy had never watched it so I decided we needed to see it. And I, I just love this movie so much. This is definitely not my first time watching it. I've probably seen it two or three times by now. It also has Ryan Reynolds in it. And even Bill Hader and Kristen Wiig are in this movie. It's just a great summer teenage movie. It takes place in an amusement park where a bunch of teenagers work at in the summer. And obviously a romance is involved and relationships happen. When it comes to romances, I feel like this one goes in line with like the more realistic romances that feel real and not so cheesy or forced. It's funny because Krista Stewart sometimes bothers me like her face and and in this movie um, I feel different like I feel like it works you know the whole awkwardness works in this film and Jesse Eisenberg obviously is known for also being a terribly awkward character in all the movies that he's in and he just does it so well that it feels really believable and they do feel like real people. Another summer romance film that I watched is called Vicky Cristina Barcelona. This is a 2008 Woody Allen film that is a romance and drama that is free on YouTube. So that's nice. Take advantage now while it's free. This is a quirky Woody Allen style film that takes place in the summer. Two girls decide to go visit Spain for the summer. It also stars Javier Bardem and Penelope Cruz and Scarlett Johansson and Rebecca Hall. I do remember watching this film in 2008 when it first came out and I was 18 at the time. There's a part in the movie where there's a three-way relationship between two women and a man and they like live together and they're in a relationship with three. And I remember that being so insane to me <laughs> at the time. Like watching it when I was 18, I was like, I don't get it. That's crazy. And then I was watching it this time not that I would ever do this, but for some reason it made sense in this setting, in this film with these people. And yeah, I really enjoy this film. I think um, 
My only problem with it is that the Rebecca Hall character, I felt like she could have just been removed completely. I felt like we didn't need her story plot at all and they could have just stuck to the whole movie being about Scarlett Johansson's character and it would have been fine. Like, I don't think we needed her. Next up we have There's Something About Mary. This is a 1998 film on Hulu right now that is a romantic comedy. Again, I watched a lot of romantic comedies this month and I love this film. Again, this is not my first time watching it. Um, Jeremy had never seen it, so I needed him to be educated. And this stars Ben Stiller, Cameron Diaz, Matt Dillon. I feel like it's a classic. You know, everybody recognizes that one famous scene. You know, I'll start the picture here. And you watch it again and you realize how well done that film is. There's so much oddness to it and it's so quirky and, and weird in the best way possible. And it's also adorable and sweet and I don't know. It's cheesy and silly and it's all the things that leaves you feeling good, if that makes sense. It's a, it's a feel good, happy, romantic comedy. So the next film on this list is actually nothing to do with Summer, but it's influenced off of There's Something About Mary. So we were watching that movie and there's a part in the movie where she talks about her favorite movie being Harold and Maude. And I feel like I've been living under a rock or I don't know because apparently Harold and Maude is a very big cult classic movie that I had never known about. And it is a 1971 comedy romance classic film that is currently on Paramount Plus. It is about a boy named Harold who is a very deadpan 20 year old who is obsessed with death. And then Maude who is an 80 year old eccentric and fun loving character and basically they get in a very taboo relationship together. And then Cat Stevens is the soundtrack of the whole movie. It's definitely different. <laughs> I will say that I was definitely expecting to see a lot more romance between the two of them and you really don't see them do much. It's not like that. The romantic relationship they have is almost more of a friendship. And yes, maybe there is some romantic aspects to their relationship, but I was kind of anticipating it being way more, I guess, like crazy and taboo. And um, it was more tamed than that, so I'm kind of glad in a way, because that would have been kind of weird. I thought it was interesting. I don't think it's a cult classic for me, but <laughs> it was interesting. I, I Worth the watch at least once, you know? The next film I saw was Juno, and this is another coming of age style movie that I love. It came out in 2007 and it stars Elliot Page and Michael Cera, as well as Jason Bateman and Jennifer Garner. I feel like everybody knows what Juno's about. It's about a girl who's pregnant and she's in high school. She decides that she doesn't want to keep her baby, so she finds a couple that she wants to give her baby to. That couple has their own problems and it all gets complicated and it, it's a really it's just a good movie, you know? It's adorable, it's quirky, it's lovable. I think lovable is the perfect word to explain this film. Um, there's something very wholesome about this film amongst all the sarcasm and quirk and sass between the characters. It's free on YouTube right now, so take advantage again. Next up we have 30 minutes or less. And obviously this was inspired by the fact that I just saw Jesse Eisenberg in Adventureland and then I told Jeremy, have you seen 30 Minutes or Less with Jesse Eisenberg? And he was like, what? And I'm like, the one with the bomb on his chest and he's like, I have not seen this. So we had to watch it. It is a 2011 comedy action film starring Jesse Eisenberg, Danny McBride, Aziz Ansari, Nick Swardson, and it's about a pizza delivery guy who gets um, in a situation where he ends up with a bomb strapped to his chest and he has, it's not 30 minutes, <laughs> he doesn't have 30 minutes even though that's what the title says, it kind of makes you think that but no, he has a certain amount of hours to rob a bank and make a certain amount of money to give to these bad guys so that he can get the bomb off his chest it is wild and crazy and hilarious at the same time definitely has parts where there's like anxiety involved in watching it because you're just like freaking out for him, especially if you like Denny McBride or Jesse Eisenberg because there's a certain type of character in both of those people in all the films they're at. If you at all enjoy them, then you will enjoy this film. Okay, the next film is one of my personal favorites. It's called Music and Lyrics and I feel like it's super underrated. It came out in 2007 and it is a romantic comedy starring Drew Barrymore and Hugh Grant. 
I did pay $3 on Amazon Prime to watch it, but I wanted my mom to see this film. <laughs> I remember watching this film in the summer of 2007. I was 17 and I was working at a summer camp. And I remember how much I fell in love with this movie, mostly because of the music and the whole concept of it being centered around a musician who has to write a song. Um, he's a former pop star who is kind of like washed out and old now and he is trying to get himself back into the door of being known again or relevant. There's a pop star diva character named Cora, and he has to write a song for her that she'll sing with him. So he has like, I think like a day to write a song. He gets Drew Barrymore to help him write the song with him because she's a better writer and together they come up with this adorable song that I forever will love called Way Back Into Love. I also feel like the romance and the chemistry between Hugh Grant and Drew Barrymore feels real to me again, like that realistic love that I enjoy watching in films that's not too cheesy or too out of this world, you know? And I, I really like it and I think it's a cute romantic comedy if you've never checked it out. I would say it's worth the three dollars on Amazon Prime. The next film is called The Five Year Engagement. It is a 2012 romantic comedy starring Jason Segel, Chris Pratt, Emily Blunt, and also features Alison Brie. I am surprised I have never heard of this film. The only reason I found it was because I love Chris Pratt and I was searching through films he had been in because I feel like I only have known him to be as like the superhero character um, in all these recent films and I'm just like has he ever been anything else in a film before so then I found out there was a film Called the five-year engagement and he is in it and he is not a superhero character he, This is him back in like Parks and Rec era where he's more of this like frumpy Silly guy. I also really love Jason Segel. Forgetting Sarah Marshall is one of my favorite movies ever and he's in that one So when I saw Jason Segel was in it and then Emily Blunt, I was like, okay, I need to watch this. It is about a couple who keep setting a date for their wedding and then certain obstacles get in the way and they keep having to like push back their date for the wedding and then basically five years go by. And honestly, it's okay. <laughs> I wanted to be able to hype this film up and I was really hoping for it to be really great. And, and it's okay. I felt like it took a weird turn at some point and then it found itself back again. And you know, it wasn't bad but it wasn't great. When it comes to romantic comedies, it definitely doesn't stand out. And it's weird because with such great actors, I felt like it wasn't their fault, it was just maybe the actual screenplay of the film is odd. The way they bounce around with time in this film is kind of weird and throws you off a little bit and makes you disconnected and I think that's probably part of it, but the actors are great. Okay, last film is Father of the Bride, <laughs> but the 1991 version that stars Steve Martin and Martin Short. It is a romantic comedy that we paid $3 on Amazon Prime to watch because it's not free anywhere. And that's okay because I really needed to see this film. After seeing The Father of the Bride that came out last month on HBO Max, I wanted to see what the Steve Martin version was like. This film to me felt like a Christmas movie and I don't know how to explain exactly why, but I got such Christmas vibes off of it. I felt this like warm Christmas movie feeling from this film. Really surprisingly wasn't as funny as I was expecting it to be. Martin Short's character is hilarious. He's the funniest part and obviously Steve Martin has some parts that were funny. He, it was more like a cutesy, wholesome family film, like Christmas vibes. I don't know why. Yeah, I just thought it'd be funnier. I don't know. I, I guess I was expecting more from like the Steve Martin and Martin Short combo. I guess because I'm watching Murders in the Building, I was expecting more of a back and forth between them and they really don't have that many like as scenes that give me that. It's cute, it's fine. Well that's it for the month of July and now let's see what August brings. I'm excited to watch hopefully some more new movies. Please leave recommendations down below so I can have some stuff to like make sure I watch this month but if not I'm just gonna end up watching a bunch of old films again and I, I feel like I wanna share new films and I don't know what happened this month. Let me know what films you saw in July and what you're looking forward to in August and I will see you the next month. So toodaloo!